Excellent. Glad you remembered that. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I'm Linda Kuhn. I'm Dean of the Honors College. I really appreciate you coming on what has been for me at least a very strange day with this weird weather and it appears to be getting stranger. So first thing, make sure everyone stay home and stay safe. But it's my great pleasure to introduce the second of our Honors College sneak previews for our fall 2021 Signature Seminars. And Signature Seminars taught in the Honors College bring together star faculty with an amazing and interdisciplinary crew of students from multiple colleges and many different majors and intellectual interests. And we always feature our distinguished colleagues on KUAF Ozarks at Large. I hope you had a chance to hear Dr. Banton give a fabulous sneak preview of this lecture with Kyle Kellams. I had the great pleasure of listening to that yesterday evening and it was fantastic. So you're in for a great treat tonight. And so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Kari Banton. But I wanna remind the students first that A, definitely take Black Utopias in the fall of 2021. And B, remember, you actually have to apply to take a seat in this seminar. And the application process and all the explanation is up on the Honors College website. So, and I can answer questions about that too in the Q&A. So we're gonna have Dr. Banton give a overview of this fabulous seminar. And then we will take questions from the audience and our Honors College Ambassador, Engineering Major, Creighton France, will actually be moderating the Q&A. So, Dr. Banton, there she is. Great, so thank <laughs> Dr. you. Dr. Banton, no, I have to introduce you first. Oh, right. <laughs> so, no, that's all right. Um, my colleague, Dr. Banton, is an expert in Caribbean history, African diaspora history, and critical race theory. She's the Director of African and African American Studies boot, boot, at the University of Arkansas. She's also an incredibly gifted historian who's had many national fellowships, who published a book in 2019 with Cambridge University Press. And the book is entitled More Auspicious Shores, Barbadian Migration to Liberia, Blackness and the Making of the African Republic 1865 to 1912. And I think Black Utopias is pretty much spinning off of that fabulous book and also merging with Dr. Banton's new interests in material culture and the archeology span of the back, Black to, back to Africa movement, which I think is a project that she's sort of beginning, beginning to give birth to right at this moment. Dr. Banton received her PhD from Vanderbilt. She has several MAs, overachiever, uh, one from the University of Ghana and another from the University of Nor New Orleans. So, Dr. Karee Banton, hoot, hoot, take it away. We're ready for Black Utopias. Great, uh, thank you all so very much. Uh, special thanks to uh, my friend and uh, uh, my, uh, what do I call her? What name? The name is not even coming to mind right now. Just an inspiration, Linda. Um, thank you for having me, uh, John, uh, and all the coordinating members of the Honors College that made this a reality. So I'm going to try to see how much of this I can get through and allow some time for question and answer but kind of you know, take you through some of these ideas that I'll be grappling with in the course. Now, in 1512, Thomas More uh, became the first person to write of a utopia, a word used to describe this perfect imaginary world. Um, and More's book uh, imagines this complex self-contained community set on an island in which people share a common culture and a way of life. And more depicted um, a government promoted that promoted harmony, uh, hierarchical order. However, his um, description could, could be construed 
as a polemical attack on existing government. Uh, for instance, he talked about noblemen, um, more complained, um, you know, about those who drone, who live like drones on the labor of others, tenants being evicted, so that the insatiable glutton and a cursed plague of his native land may consolidate his fields. Monarchs, you know, would do well to swear at their inauguration to never have more than a thousand pounds of gold in their coffers, right? And perhaps for this reason, um, Utopia, you know, probably Queen is not reading this. Um, you know, it was a light reading back in those days. Um, but, you know, uh, he talked about war not being, um, war being fit only for beasts, um, standing armies being disbanded. Um, he, he, his, he had a defense of Roman Catholicism that later led to his execution. Um, on the orders of England's King Henry VIII, who had broken away from the church. And so all of these ideas, but at the same time, more um, in Utopia, um, when he coined the place, he meant, um, defined it as no place, as nowhere, right? Um, and other coinage um, came to be um, the Utopia, a good or happy place or a fortunate place, right? Um, which became one of the translation. Right um, now, you know, Moore said that the ancients call me utopia or nowhere because of my isolation. And at present, however, I am a rival of Plato's Republic, perhaps even a victor over it. The reason is that what he has delineated in, in words, I alone have exhibited in men and resources and laws of surpassing excellence. Deservedly ought I to be called by name Utopia or Happy Land. So this kind of utopianism or social dreaming, right? Um, you know, clearly people have been having this kind of social, um, you know, these dreams from well before the word was coined by Moore, right? Um, and depending on the time period and the culture within which they occur, such dreams or even nightmares may take many different forms. They may take the form of myth, um, stories, philosophical treaties, um, even law codes. But you know, such dreams occur in every time period and in every culture, um, albeit they play more or less um, important roles in different periods and different cultures. Now, the earliest uh, myth presented um, the dreams as being brought into being by nature or the gods with a little role for human action. But Human tend to want their lives to be ordered by themselves, to be under their control, or at least not to be simply dependent on the whim or the vagaries of nature or God. Therefore, quite early, what we now call utopia um, was presented as something that could be brought about through human action, right? Through the authors. And so although the authors of utopia can be idiosyncratic um, in extreme, the content of utopia has always depended upon what was perceived to be wrong in the time and place that the utopia was created. Um, and, and, and so it is based on all of that then. Um, and, and given the kinds of dystopia that has characterized the lives of black people since the modern era, the dehumanization of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, neoliberalism, lynching, mass incarceration, all these other experiences um, that informed, um, you know, a strain of thought that scholars have now called Afro-pessimism, you know, in debt to authors like Franz Fanon and Celia Hartman and Hart, Hart and Spillers, you know, that contend that there's this fundamentally antagonistic relationship between Blackness and the human Right. This is what makes, um, you know, having a class that explores black utopias and utopian ideals so critical. Right. Now, I remember the energy and the feeling um, that people had after seeing Black Panther. Right. The idea that explorers, you know, had coming off this idea of utopian that explorers had searched for a place that uh, they called El Dorado. Um, that, you know, was hidden in Africa, right? Now, as 
Katrina Brown argues, Wakanda, the fictional country in which Black Panther takes place, um, is a modern utopia in many ways, isolated, technologically and medically advanced, low in poverty, high in citizen satisfaction, rich in natural resources. Um, and we see um, Wakanda, uh, you know, th this issue in Wakanda about sharing resources and technology with others, risking threat from others in society, should they remain isolated and let others suffer, right? Um, remain aloof, right? Um, but never recognize that doing so had, you know, consequences. We see, um, you know, Killmonger, um, who, who is a native Wakandan abandoned child um, of the ghettos of America, um, the new King T'Challa and the rest of the country having to come face to face with the product of uh, poverty and desperation endured by many minority populations that they had been trying so hard to ignore. And so Black Panther uses King, um, Killmonger as this embodiment of, of the suffering Wakanda that um, increasingly turns uh, a blind eye to, uh, to, you know, to, to others with the onset of the 20th and 21st century. So as a native Wakandan, Killmonger then um, comes to represent this, um, this struggle um, as a child left behind as Wakandans enjoy peace and prosperity, right? Now, um, movies along with the rest of pop culture are not made in a vacuum. Uh, Wakanda, uh, like more, serves as a, a metaphor and, and a critique of modern society, modern American society, right? Um, utopian fiction in particular um, does this kind of a thing, right? It's created as a way to hold up a mirror to the society in which um, the creator lives and also proposing this critique of the problems he or she sees in it. And this is what Black Panther does um, in this vision of Wakanda, right? It creates this colonization free narrative of black empowerment, one that serves as a model for what America with its affluence and power might strive towards. Um, and so this is the purpose of these kinds of, you know, uh, ideas, utopia and utopian ideals, right? Um, the premise then here in, in, in Black Panther then is to avoid a kind of white savior narrative. And this becomes the, the, the center of why it became such a phenomenon among black people, right? Um, but also calling attention to the harms and dangers of ignoring persistent social inequality, right? So using this frame, Black Panther gives his audience um, much needed perspective as it poses, um, you know, critical questions about society, right? Um, whether it's just, you know, um, whatever is just and equitable, right? Um, questions about um, suffering, questions about wealth and technology, right? Um, you know, moving to, uh, to make amends through the distribution of resources and technology to those in need, right? So these are the critiques that, that um, Black Panther makes. Um, and uh, just like Black Panther, um, you know, um, you know, um, we're in this current period where uh, it, Black Panther function is this kind of a gateway for humans to break and to rethink um, their lives and to think about society in new ways and to imagine their world anew. We're living now um, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that has produced utopian dreams of a virus-free world um, you hear common assertions that we cannot go back to life as it existed, right? We have to find a new and better way, right? So here we have, you know, Black uh, utopian ideals that reached us through this fictional world of uh, Wakanda, um, you know, situated supposedly, you know, in Africa. Um, but long before Black Panther and the pandemic, oppressed people in their efforts to articulate agendas uh, for self-determination had embraced uh, utopian ideals. 
um, Black utopian logic works to decolonize and to de-link from the colonial matrix of power by maintaining um, a, a separation from uh, European culture and thought, right? Um, so you see, you might see stories, um, you know, similar to you might have, you know, the Jews have the Zionist utopia, right? Um, as a chief cultural, uh, uh, as a touchstone, right? So similarly for Black people, they've also had, um, uh, you know, in the modern era, uh, a social and political imaginary that has been also structured and informed by utopian visions. And so Black nationalist thinkers in the USA, in the Caribbean, in Africa at different points, envision in great detail this um, society that would shield them from the perils of white supremacy and racist oppression. And through fugitivity, right, through emigration to places like Haiti, to Canada, to Liberia, to Ghana, to Paris at one time, people like James Baldwin, right, um, you know, numerous other spaces. Black utopia then came to represent the convergence of Black escapism with ethnic, nationalist, and political po possibilities. So um, despite the differences in, in places, movements, um, leaders, philosophies, Black people um, have come to confront um, this idea of, of utopia, right? Um, in the 20th century, um, painters, um, musicians, fiction writers um, would continue to intervene upon utopian traditions of Black culture, right? Um, you know, uh, critically examine ideas of anti-utopia, heterotopia, dystopia, using um, artistic and philosophical renderings of Black life in outer space, right? Um, and so Black utopia has become um, more prominently a site for um, what scholars are now calling Afrofuturist ideas. So the course, ultimately, in the course, we want to engage the various ways in which um, Black people have sought to envision and think about and philosophize about creating uh, a, a better world than the one they were experiencing. And ultimately, I'm going to be using case studies to explore the historical genealogy of Black experimentation with utopia and utopian ideals that does um, culminate um, with Wakanda, right? Um, so the class will not only chart the history of Black utopian visions from maroon communities, but also attempts at radical community formation in places like, as I mentioned, Nova Scotia, in Canada, Eatonville, Florida, Harlem, New York, nation building in republics like Liberia and Haiti, right? And to examine how Black people have articulated these utopian visions, we will read historical works alongside short stories and novels and science fiction and speculative fiction of W.E.B. Du Bois. A lot of people don't know that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote other works beyond history and sociology. He wrote also short stories um, that, you know, fall into the genre of utopian writing. Um, George Shuler, Oct Octavia Butler, right? Um, where people are contemplating ideas about Blackness, metaphysics, um, we'll look at art, music um, from the likes of People, of Sun Ra, George Clinton and the Parliament Funkadelics, Fela Kuti, uh, Lee Scratch Perry from the reggae genre, um, Andre 3000 from hip hop, right? And, and end up in Wakanda, you know, where um, I just started, right? So um, we'll use the class to, to think through these different historical points where Black people are envisioning these um, possibilities of freedom um, and, you know, to explore these vibrant history um, uh, of utopian thought throughout Black studies and African-American literature and culture, right? Um, how they've, you know, help us to get further to ideas about emancipation, how they've intervened in uh, the utopian traditions of American literature and culture, right? How they've contributed to ideas of Black 
radical of the black radical tradition right ideas about afrofuturism afro pessimism afro optimism right um and how this all of this all together poses a particular challenge to western thought um and how it contributes to it how it helps to reconfigure it as well uh, as it helps to reconfigure and shape black studies at the same time and so for the rest of the time i want to give um, kind of three examples of the kinds of case studies that we might look at um, in this course. Um, uh, Marunage uh, is one of the case studies that I'd want us to address, right? Um, now, uh, if we think about, um, we talked about um, dystopia and the experiences that Black people uh, had. Um, you know, they encountered uh, many different forms of dehumanization that, um, you know, accompanied each stage of enslavement, um, the enslavement process with a variety of uh, Black people use a variety of covert and overt strategies to resist this dehumanization. And one of the most prolific strategies was maronage, right? Um, enslaved people. Um, escaped and found their own communities and kingdoms. Um, they came to be uh, known as Maroons um, from the Spanish uh, term Cimarron, meaning wild or untamed. And unlike other runaways, some of whom, you know, headed it to northern, um, you know, in the case of the United States, northern cities, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and elsewhere, Maroons tended to live in the wilderness. Um, often in difficult to reach places. And they were determined to build their own self-ruled communities with um, landscape and the forces of nature serving as a, bu a buffer between their new lives and the society that enslaved them. So um, black people envisioned these alternative communities and they began to take shape in as, you know, the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, and many of them are still in existence today, known um, variously as uh, palenques in Cuba, um, quilombos in Brazil, macombos, cumbes, laderas, uh, ma 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 mambisas, right? Um, and these, these maroon communities range from tiny bands that survive less than a year to powerful states, right? Um, that encompassed thousands of members and survived uh, for generations and into the present, right? Now, Marinage, um, you know, as I said, uh, were people, these people were cultivating freedom on their own terms in a society that was bent on their dehumanization and their enslavement. They were bent on uh, demarcating social space that would allowed them to enact um, subversive um, acts of speech and gestures and social practices that were antithetical to the larger society in which they existed. Now, one of the biggest uh, groups of Maroons uh, was the Palmeiras Maroons in Brazil that had uh, Zumbi as one of its last warrior king. Right, um, so the Quilombo or Maroon community of fugitive slaves in, hidden in the rugged backcountry of the Brazilian Northeast where um, slavery was most prolific became the home of uh, where historians uh, uh, estimate of up to about 20,000 runaway slaves, free blacks, Indians, and settlers of mis ancestry who repelled the repeated assaults of European slavers for almost a century, right? Um, Portuguese eventually managed to defeat Zumbi's guerrillas. Um, memories of Palmeiras um, have evolved in present day into myth that powerfully shapes uh, Brazilian politics and popular culture. Um, but even then it fanned the flame of slave resistance, it's inspired um, in present day, generations of Black activists and intellectuals who challenge racism, capitalism, military rule, um, and um, continue to, you know, be a form of community creation in Brazil. 
Another of these um, maroon communities um, existed in Jamaica under the leadership of Nanny of the Maroons. Um, in 1720, Nanny uh, led, a um, led a band of uh, self-emancipated Black people in, in the unrelenting struggle for independence um, from, uh, you know, creating an empire of uh, enslaved Africans. And Nanny became the leader of the, the Maroon settlement that eventually would become known as Nanny Town that was located in the Blue Mountain region of Jamaica, right? At the same time, Nanny headed this community, her contemporaries um, uh, of a similar Akan background in Jamaica, um, Kojo, Akampang, Kofi, Kwako, led other Maroon communities in Jamaica, right? Nanny trained her warriors in the art of guerrilla warfare and turned Jamaica's tropical interior into a world of green menace where the bush or the tree could prove deadly. The British could not see these rebels coming. They were everywhere and nowhere, stirring up a fog of fear. Um, Jamaican Maroons uh, narrate their own history through the language, um, their history of Maroons, Marinage through the, the language of Obia. And um, they, the planters and colonial observers and 18th century Jamaicans consistently correlated Ovi, Ovia, the practice, the African religious practice of Obia, right, as a grave threat to the slaveholding regime, right? The British describe the Leeward Maroons, for example, um, during the state of actual rebellion as a person whom they call Obia man, whom they greatly revered and his word carried great force of an oracle with them being consulted on every occasion, right? Um, when the British attempted to negotiate peace with the, the Maroons, you know, they were uh, given, given the fearlessness of the Maroons, um, they would often be captured consulting their Obia woman, right, who often performed various acts, right, um, to, to protect uh, the warriors from the British enemies. Now, um, I've heard legends about Nanny of the Maroons, um, many stories um, survive, or legends survive in documents about her ability to catch bullets in her buttocks. Um, and other accounts suggest that they were able to catch it in her hands. Um, but the British um, fought Nanny and her Maroon troops for a good period of time. Um, they, uh, the, the Maroons, um, you know, sought refuge in various, hiding deeper and deeper into the forest until they ultimately forced the British in 1739 to sign a peace treaty with them and granting them uh, 500 acres of land upon which they settled, right? Um, this settlement um, was dubbed um, Nanny Town. And now, um, given the exploit and what Nanny uh, and the settlement and the kinds of utopian vision of that Maroon community, Nanny is now one of Jamaica's national hero, as you can see in the statue here down at the bottom. Um, she's a national heroine, and she's currently on the Jamaican $500 bill, right? Um, in recent times, I've even seen um, juxtaposition of her and Kamala Harris, um, Kamala Harris in the recent elections, but I wouldn't go that far. Um, now, um, in the United States, we have many examples of Maroon communities, um, the Mount Bayou uh, Maroons, the Black Seminoles, but it's the Maroons that lived in the great dismal swamps that have occupied scholarly imagination in recent times. Um, and it's understandable why people call, you know, why people are so fascinated with the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp, because it was indeed um, extremely dismal, right? Temperatures uh, reached um, over 100 degrees. It was humid, soggy, filled with thorns and tickets, dangerous wildlife, um, panthers, right? Um, lived there, bat beards, snakes. Um, yellow flies, mosquitoes, right? But, um, you know, this place was basically thought to be impenetrable, 
right? But it still attracted people, right? Um, um, even though uh, colonists um, couldn't go in there with their horses and it was detested, um, you know, by, by, by them, right? Um, it did not matter that they could not inhabit this place. Um, you know, thousands of enslaved African-Americans escaped their captors and would form uh, utopian communities in the swamp. Right, um, and this dismal landscape became the site of one of the most remarkable um, stories of the resistance um, to slavery in American histories. Right, um, stories of escaped slaves who settled there started appearing in newspaper and other sources in the 1700s, uh, and in recent time, archaeologists have found evidence that people were living in the swamp long before that. Right. Um, now, over, you know, all these, uh, the swamp became the home to these self-sufficient um, Maroons um, serving as a stopping point for others who were fleeing to the north on the Underground Railroad, right? Um, it also became um, dangerous um, in some sense um, at one point as canals allowed slave catchers to get into the swamp over a period of time. But econ new economic opportunities would be carved out. Um, Maroons were able to uh, cut lumber and shingles for lumber company and, and thus um, create an alternative model uh, to the economies of slavery and survive um, in the Great Dismal Swamp. Right now, Frederick Law Olmsted, who traveled in the South as a journalist um, before he took up landscape architecture, um, you know, gave an account of his travels and, and, and highlighted the potential given what he saw these maroon communities embody. And he gave an account of the potential of African Americans to live as free people in the United States, very much to the um, contrary of those who thought that. Uh, African Americans um, living as free people was very much incompatible with the United States. And so um, Olmsted, for whom sense of place was especially strong, characterized these, in, um, these Maroons um, relative freedom, um, you know, outlined um, these sites uh, as places of resistance, um, you know, and um, highlighted um, a lot about um, their existence. Um, he talked about, you know, um, he asked if, if locals ever shot, um, sh um, you know, shot at the Maroons. And, you know, people noted that some of them would rather be shot than be took. So that spoke to, um, you know, the desire for freedom and, 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 and how, Maroons in the swamp were embodying this idea of freedom that were, was only being articulated by those uh, who um, were, you know, highlighting, were writing policy um, in the United States, right? Now, uh, the, 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 Elaine Scarry, who gave a, a lecture here um, some time ago, um, spoke about the architecture of assembly as embodied by Maroons, right? Um, and formulated by Frederick Law Olmsted, right? Um, and suggests that, um, you know, um, the right of assembly is connected to the right of free speech as both occur in the First Amendment of the US Constitution and that the Maroons who gathered together in defiance of law as and as steward of the environment embody not only the right of assembly and free speech, but also set in place the standard for bringing community members and leaders together to work together towards a sheer vision for future growth and development. Right. So um, here we have uh, you know ways in which Maroons are bringing um, about these ideas that are helping to expand and, and build on these ideas that um, 
you know, uh, are, are thought to be the domain of enlightened white men, um, thinkers, right? Um, you know, people like Salah Mullins insist that um, the black, um, always the slave and still always um, are the ones who truly invented liberty, right? But we tend to look for this in books and articles and, you know, everyday conversation dedicated to the right of free speech without thinking about these kinds of other disciplinary architecture, uh, archeology, span um, ways of thinking about um, how we can get to ideas about the, the emergence of the right of assembly and free speech um, and, and, bring in, and, and examine, examining more Maroon communities as a way of thinking about that. In the same regard, uh, Laurent Dubois in his uh, article An Enslaved Enlightenment trace out how uh, Enlightenment critiques of colonial slavery in the Caribbean emerge in the second half of the 18th century in relation to the daily problems of colonial governance in the, col uh, the colonies, right? And, and administrators in the slave colonies of the Caribbean during this period argued um, they, were, they, they were very deeply concerned about the problems of maronage, right? These frequently escaping um, enslaved people, um, they were concerned about the high mortality and violence um, they had towards the masters. And they wrote extensively about these problems, um, you know, creating analysis and documents that informed the writing of central texts of that period, particularly if we think about you know, Abby Renal's multi-volume history of European colonialism, um, La Histoire de Dor in Days, right? And so the criticism of slavery that expanded over the course of the 18th century then was not the progress of humanism that created its own values and succeeded in imposing a conception of man. In fact, the humanism of the philosophies adjusted itself to the economic, social, and political realities and proposed solutions that coincided with those um, advocated at the same time by administrators of different colonies and clerks who were terrified of what was going on by what the Maroons were doing. So the Maroons then were at the center um, of these, the preoccupation with these fugitive slaves were at the center of these texts um, in, the, in the 18th century, the, the persistence of anxiety right, about you know, you know, impossibility of ending their rebellion, um, you know, the, the ways in which these uh, philosophers thought of them as heroic rebels, right, greatly inform what we've commonly thought about as enlightenment thought. So the Maroons, by creating their utopian communities, greatly help us to expand what we traditionally think about as, uh, as enlightenment um, thinking. Right, and these occur all over, um, you know, the Caribbean. From um, in the Caribbean, the case of McCandle, Nanny of the Maroons, Kajo, right? All of these maroon societies are um, expanding um, what we think about as the human, as the dignity of man, right? By their subversive activities, their refusal of injustice, they were directly the real models um, in the Caribbean in which thinkers were thinking about these real categories and ideas about um, liberty and freedom and um, all of these ideas that came to inform our political lives, right? Um, so the resistance that was practiced um, in the Great Dismal Swamp in the Caribbean um, was therefore a part of the intellectual and political activity that comprise the Enlightenment. Some historians like to call that the, the present, um, the absent presence, right? And um, even though for the most part, they did not participate um, in the production of writing about the basic questions about humanity and the nature of rights and slavery, these, these um, rebels, um, these Maroons were nevertheless key actors in this broader history. They were speculating um, in their communities on the ideal conditions that would fulfill their desires. They blew up existing ideas of what it meant to be human, 
to be a citizen, to be a member of a community, what it meant to have liberty. And they expanded these meanings that was limited and defined solely through the narrow ideals of white men. Now, in the next example, I want to um, trace the idea of liberty, um, you know, um, that is so often uh, uh, associated with, um, expand that idea of, of liberty associated with the enlightenment um, and, you know, and, and show other ways in which uh, black people were uh, embodying, by embodying it was expanding upon its meaning, right? Um, this, how they were taking this radical act of political um, and philosophical speculation and deliberating over meanings of freedom, liberty, citizenship, and nationhood, um, how they took that further and why it is critical, right? Um, you know, uh, Franz Fanon and um, Franz Fanon and Afro pessimist um, thinkers tend to think about uh, the black experience as fixed, um, as blackness. They think of blackness as this kind of a prison house that make metaphysical identifications impossible. Right, um, Fanon, for instance, um, insists that though black people are sentient, um, that the structure of the world's uh, semantic field is suited by anti-black um, solidarity, right? And, and he sees this through the kind of gratuitous uh, violence of, you know, that existed in the middle passage in slavery, colonialism, um, and so on, right? Um, and we begin to see how other ways in which black people start to think their way out of that beyond maronage. We see this in this petition um, by black people to go to Africa, right? Um, this kind of audacious hope, um, you know, um, among the black community, right? That would, um, you know, give rise to a, a desire to create their alter uh, an alternative community outside of America, beside, you know, um, beyond what they were able to manage in a maroon community, right? Um, this notion was picked up by um, Paul Cuffey, who was a sailor, um, ultimately um, brought uh, 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 free black people to Sierra Leone, right? And uh, had organized another vo voyage to go to Sierra Leone and contemplating creating a, a, a colony like Sierra Leone um, and ultimately died before he was able to realize that, right? Now, um, America was never able to give all the things that black people desired in terms of freedom um, and citizenship, um, but, um, you know, uh, Black people was able to take that idea that America was thinking about for itself and, uh, and, and transcribe it in, um, in their own nation in Liberia, right? Um, here we have, they create a nation that pretty much looks like America, right? Trying to perfect what America was never able to give to them um, with this motto, the love of liberty brought us here, right? Again, expanding this idea of liberty and freedom, right? Um, so this Black Republic, Liberia, that was founded as a colony by the American Colonization Society um, uh, and, 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 and built and became an independent republic in 1847, would emerge as a utopia for African Americans, right? Um, at the same time, like I said, Af uh, African Americans are critiquing um, um, America through um, this discussion about Liberia, right? Um, the, many decided not to go, right? You see um, this response by the free Black Philadelphians um, responding to the American Colonization Society where they said, Whereas our ancestors, not of choice, were the first successful cultivators of the wilds of America, we, their descendants, feel ourselves entitled to participate in the blessings of our luxuriant soil, which their blood and sweat have manured, and that any measure or system of measures with a tendency to ban us from her bosom would not only be in direct violation of those principles which have been the boast of this republic. 
So even as they're trying to create this utopia in Liberia, they are pushing America to reconsider um, what it says that it is, right? And it is internalizing all these American Republican ideals about um, what is citizenship, right? Who gets to own the land? Our ancestors' blood, sweat, and tears is in the land, and therefore we are the proper owners of this land, right? And you see they're, them uh, embracing that idea of liberty, right? That devotion to that idea of liberty in naming the new country Liberia and, and, and using, as their new mot using it in their new motto, stating that the love of liberty brought us here, right? Um, just um, advertising my book, <laughs> um, Thomas Jefferson, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, saw the expatriation of Black people as a solution to the, the problem of um, uh, American uh, Enlightenment ideals, right? Um, but um, ultimately, as I said, uh, the, the, the migrants to Liberia were able to, to critique what uh, colonizationists were trying to do by, by internalizing the very same ideals and redeploying it at um, people like Jefferson. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, Liberia uh, emerged as a republic, uh, Barbadians, African-Americans, um, native uh, ethnic groups of Africans ultimately um, ended up in the republic. And we would see, uh, some of the same issues um, re-emerge in that society that would plague America. And that is one of the issues that we will discuss in the class, uh, the kinds of struggles that utopias go through that um, you know, uh, they would re-inscribe ideas about author authoritarianism, um, hierarchies of colonialism, um, white supremacy, would be reinscribed um, in some of these uh, society um, once again, right? Uh, I'm going to try to wrap it up in the next four minutes, Linda. Uh, well, in the next couple of minutes. The, the next um, last example I want to think about is the artistic side of, of utopia and um, think about Parliament Funkadelic and the, the music of uh, musicians like George Clinton and his band, The Parliament, um, that has been referred to by scholars as a prime example of these kinds of utopian ideas, Afrofuturist um, speculative ideas that addresses African-American concerns about, um, you know, technoculture, Black nationalism, um, self-determination and freedom from white supremacist um, thinking. And so you can see, um, you know, in some of the lyrics here, how uh, George Clinton is doing that star child here, citizens of the universe, I bring forth to you the good time on the mothership. Are you hip, right? And so I want to show you uh, a brief little video um, in which uh, George Clinton attempts to take African Americans away on the mothership. So let me. Sorry, I think I have to share sound.
I am technologically Hey, Creighton, is there anything you can do to help? I can you, uh, and... <laughs> did you post the link in the, the chat, Karee? Creighton might be able to share it that way. Yeah, that's what I was about to suggest. Thanks, if, Creighton. If that'll be yeah. easier than changing your own setting. Okay. I, I got I, it. By the way, Karee, this is just fabulous material. Oh, just thank so you. <laughs> Are you guys hearing? Yep. Sing, swing down, come on, you stand, y'all. Come on, sing, y'all. Let me ride. Somebody help me, Lord. Swing, yeah, let me ride. Swing down, yeah. Wait a minute. I think I see the mothership coming in, Lord. I think I hear the mothership coming in. So, I mean, uh, I don't think rappers or these kinds of musicians are landing spaceships on stage anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is just ultimately very fascinating to me, um, you know, but um, scholars uh, think about uh, um, how Parliament Funkadelic um, strive, strive, um, strove to create, um, you know, this place and environment that brought people together um, thinking about outer space where the mothership would transport people to, right? Using their lyrics, um, their songs to provide a means of, you know, um, uh, rethinking their, the current conditions of African-Americans and creating this kind of a myth scape that would be brought to life in the performance that I just showed you where people could then um, think about alternatives to their life um, in the United States. Now, um, uh, other, other, other musicians have gone on to do similar things uh, like Parliament, Parliament Funkadelic, uh, people like Andre 3000, um, who has, um, let me go back to sharing my screen, um, in his album, AT Aliens, uh, has, you know, done similar. Okay. Um, has done similar things, uh, with his, uh, with his work, um, in terms of thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, how black people can, um, escape to the future, um, you know, how black children, you know, given the conditions under which they have to survive, um, how can they escape being trapped by their skin tone, um, how, they, how they try to alienate black people. And so by keeping their head to the sky, 
very much like the Parliament Funkadelics tried to do, that they could then um, escape. Very much the same way as Sun Ra, who did the same thing um, by saying, um, suggesting that space is the place and to, for Black people to imagine um, a world beyond um, Earth that they could escape white supremacy and the travails of racism. So these are some of the topics that I ultimately will um, cover in the class. I think uh, use various attempts at utopia and explore utopian ideas through art, through music, through uh, immigration movement and uh, fugitive activities. Um, to think about how Black people challenge their current circumstances and by doing so, um, blew up those um, ideas of what it meant to be human, what it meant to be a citizen, what it meant to have liberty and freedom, right? What it meant to have a nation and a community. So this and other, um, you know, case studies we'll look at uh, in the class. So I will take questions now if you have any. Thank you so much, Professor Banton. That was amazing. <laughs> what a class. So excited in the Honors College. I'm going to turn it over to Creighton, who's going to moderate the Q&A. And I imagine you're going to get plenty of questions. So let's go ahead and uh, get your hands up in, the, uh, in Zoom, or you can pose your questions in the chat. And Creighton, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dean Kuhn. Yeah, that was a great presentation.